Good morning, everybody. I wanted to start by reading a scripture, 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 12 to 13, where Paul has admonished them to establish their hearts blameless. May God do that. And uh, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints, as you see on the screen. With the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Not just with his angels, but with all his saints as well. Jude 14 says the same thing. So let's bow and just ask God briefly for his inspiration. Father in heaven, we come before you, heavenly Father, uh, God most high. We just ask you, Father, please anoint my speaking today with your Holy Spirit and anoint the hearing of all those hearing it. And may we get excited about what you're about to do in sending your son, your very own son, our Savior, to come and reign over the earth. May it come soon. Father, bless all this, and we watch, and we just look to you for our peace and safety. In Yeshua, in Jesus' mighty name, amen. So that was 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 12 and 13, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. We're surely in the prophesied perilous times that the Bible speaks of in 2 Timothy 3. You might want to read that if you haven't read it in a while. 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 7, how in the last days perilous, dangerous times will come. Men will be lovers of their own selves and boasters and proud and disobedient to parents and all the things it says. Read that again. And uh, we're certainly in those days now. I personally believe, and I can't prove it, but I personally believe that maybe Satan attacked God's throne one last time uh, in 2020 because it just seems like 2020, and it says he was cast down when that happens, and he comes down with a lot of fury and anger and he's going to direct that at any sense of unity. He wants to bring division. He, wants to, he hates all mankind, not just God's people. All mankind. And ever since 2020, it's been a very unusually different kind of years. With the woke agenda, the DEI agenda, and uh, the rioting, the fires, the, the, the wars and rumors of wars going on. It's just been terrible especially since 2020. But the holy days of God should give us some relief from that, at least in what we think about. They're, they should be so exciting, so exciting. There are four of them in the fall and three in the spring and summer. Uh, the first one in the fall is called the Day of Trumpets, Yom Teruah, Day of Blasts. In the Hebrew, it actually means more blasts and noise than it does trumpets, although trumpets would certainly be included probably in the blasts. By the way, the word the blowing of trumpets. The words of trumpets are not even in Leviticus 23 in the original Hebrew. It's a blowing. It's a blasting. And all four holy days in the fall point to the good news of God's plan to save as many as possible from the world uh, for his kingdom. The first three holy days start the process and they point to what Yeshua, Jesus, has done for us as our Passover, as the wave sheaf that went up to God to be accepted on our behalf, <clears throat> the days of unleavened bread. He is the unleavened bread. He is the sinless one. And we eat of him. And we get rid of our old selves. We're not trying to modify our old selves until we're good enough. We're not. We took, well, pictured our old selves, old, old selves, the leavened bread, and threw it out. I no longer live. The life I live now is by, like Galatians 2.20 says, is, is the life of Christ who gave himself for me, died for me because he loved me. Galatians 2.20 And our righteousness is not from our own works, otherwise Christ would have died in vain, Galatians 2.21 says. So my point is, the days of unleavened bread point to Yeshua, point to Jesus, and his perfection that we take in. <clears throat> so then we come to Pentecost and the marriage of God to Israel of uh, the wedding ring, the, the, um, uh, the promise, the earnest of the Holy Spirit that was given on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit given, and God committed to finishing what he started in all of us in that very, in that very time. And now we await, now for the fall, we're in the fall now, and I'm awaiting for a hurricane to come, <laughs> so I'm kind of hurrying too. But uh, anyway, Hurricane Helene in 2024. Anyway, but the last four holy days in the fall point how God will work out his plan is good news 
to start saving the whole world as, as they select him and choose him after first fighting him viciously when he first returns. So keep that in mind. I fear that many of us believers, though, have grown cold to all of this. We've gotten used to it. Oh, the holy days. And we yawn. God help us. We can get excited over a ball game, but not the coming of our Lord, the coming of the Son of God. So today pictures very likely the return of the King of Kings, Yeshua, the Son of God, Messiah, Jesus, to take over the reins of government of the earth from the former ruler, the God of this world, from Satan, and he's going to be the one who will become the God of this world when he returns. And we, the saints, are being prepared to rule with him for a thousand years, as it says in Revelation 20, verses 4, 5, and 6, and so on. And so this day should involve you directly. You should be very, very excited about it. So the Feast of Trumpets should not just be a doctrine, a teaching. The Feast of Trumpets should be very real to us, the very reason to live for Christ, for God the Father. It's good news, gospel. As bad as the world is right now, and it's going to get a lot worse first, then Jesus Christ returns to set up his kingdom after and, and saving and bringing up his elect saints, or the world would end up utterly destroyed. But for the elect's sake, it says in Matthew 24, God will intervene and send Jesus Christ. So hello everyone, I'm Philip Shields, host and founder of Light on the Rock. Thank you for coming here. Welcome to all of you who are coming. And here we try to focus on the relationships that we should be having with God the Father and Jesus and ourselves and with the fellow saints and also all people. Loving God, loving each other, the first two great commandments, in other words. So thank you for coming. I also want to thank any of you who are helping support what we do, keeping us online, uh, helping provide Bibles and and lots and lots of things, chairs and, and Feast of Tabernacles needs and food and so forth for the East African brethren who are incredibly poor beyond your understanding. Almost none of them has tap water, for example, flush toilets, running water. They don't. They have to go to the ponds and get the water there, boil that water. Uh, some of them, some few of them might have a, uh, might have some sort of well or something like that, but not very many. Also be aware that the uh, Zeno radio is available around the world 24-7. And I'll put the, the link to it in my notes. Or if you go to Light on the Rock, just below the top in blue, you'll see Zeno.fm slash radio slash Light on the Rock. And brethren, you can hear hundreds of sermons on there, my sermons, and they're playing constantly all the time. And Randy's also put some... Uh, hymns in there once in a while between the sermons there'll be a one hymn play or or something anyway we still with light in the rock believe the holy days are still in force as the new covenant church was actually required to wait now get this if god really was saying in the new covenant you don't need to keep the, the holy days or the sabbath like so many teach why would Yeshua, Jesus, why would he tell his ap the apostles, stay, Terry, stay in Jerusalem until you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit from the Father? Why did he say that? If they were being done, why did the New Covenant Church start? Start on a holy day, on Pentecost. It would make no sense if they were all being done away with. Acts 1, verses 4 to 5, tells them all to wait until it comes. So that obviously uh, did happen. They kept the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, and uh, the Holy Spirit was given. Acts 20, verse 16, says, I must keep the feast coming up. 1 Corinthians 16, 8, and so on. They kept Pentecost. They kept Passover. That's very clear in 1 Corinthians 5 and 1 Corinthians 11. The Last Supper, the Days of Unleavened Bread, they kept those days. Paul very clearly talks about Christ, our Passover. Okay, has been sacrificed for us in 1 Corinthians 5. And they clearly got together for the days of unleavened bread. It's all there. We also know that when Christ returns, 
when Christ returns to earth to reign, in Zechariah 14, it says that all the nations of the world will have to send representatives to Jerusalem to worship the king. And if they don't, in Jerusalem, if they don't, there will be famine and drought. So obviously, the New Testament church kept the holy days. They obviously will be kept in the world to come under Christ. So yes, the early Christians kept the holy days, and we do too, and you should too. Leviticus 23, verses 23 to 25, is one of the shortest descriptions for holy day in, in that chapter that lists them all. Leviticus 23, verses 23 to 25, Then the Lord, which is Jehovah, God said, I'm tired of you taking my name and changing it, exchanging it, for Baal, for Baal. Baal means Lord. So what did the translators do? The 6,800 plus times that Yehovah is Y-H-V-H is given, they changed it to the Lord. That's not what it means. That's not what it was. So I don't say the Lord. In the New Testament, the Lord refers to our Master, Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, where you read the Lord in all caps, that's taking Y-H-V-H, God's name, Yehovah. I now believe it is Yehovah. I used to say Yahweh. If you go to Zeno Radio, you'll hear me saying Yahweh in the early sermons. I really believe it's Yehovah. Then Yehovah spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying in the seventh month, seventh month of his calendar, on the first day of the month. So God's calendar months always started with a new moon. You shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of Teruah. A memorial of Teruah. It was translated blowing of trumpets. It actually means a blast of noise. Happy noise and terrified noise, depending on which side you're on. A memorial of Teruah, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. You shall make an offering made by fire to Jehovah. Numbers 29 actually lists a whole bunch of other uh, sacrifices that they had, but it also is a memorial of trumpets there. So the first day of every month was when the new moon was first sighted in Jerusalem. It's the only holy day that starts with a new moon. The new moon is not the dark of the moon. And uh, when you can't see a moon at all, but it's the first visible light of the crescent moon. God gave us lights to be signs for the festivals. If you go back to Genesis 1.14, where it says... Um, they shall be signs for seasons. The word seasons there is moed or moedim, which points to the festivals. Genesis 1.14 in the creation week. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky. Before that, God himself was the light. Just like it's going to be God himself who will be the light in the new, in the new kingdom, the newer heavens and earth. There won't need to be a sun or moon because God and his son will be the light says that in Revelation 22, I believe. But here, God said, Let there be lights at the expanse of the sky to separate day and night. They will serve as signs. This is what the Holman Apologetics Bible says. They will serve as signs for festivals, for Moedim, for Moed, and days and years. So it was the lights, not the darks. The Hebrew calendar and the exact dates continues to be a problem. So many disagree on it, understand it differently. And we'll have to wait until Yeshua comes back, Jesus comes back, and teaches us exactly what's the right way. I find it very frustrating because we're all over the board on this. And um, please study it prayerfully and then decide and ask God to help guide you to what you have to do. The Young's literal translation of Leviticus 23, 24 says, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of shouting, teruah. Memorial of shouting is Young's literal translation, a holy convocation. That means a time to get together with other brethren. Holman says, You shall have a commem commemoration of jubilation. Commemoration of jubilation. 
It'll be jubilation if you're on God's side. It won't be jubilation if you're not. It's going to be horrible if you're not. So you can see that it's really not just about a lot of trumpet blasts. Okay, I hope you see that. And uh, happy jubilation if you're on Jesus' side. And uh, trumpets were to be blown, shofars, teruah, blasts, shouts. Excuse me. I do have a horn here. I've got a big long one. And I don't know how well I'll blow it. of what it sounded like. I have a smaller ram's horn that they also use, but I don't blow it very well. So hopefully you have some idea uh, that they heard the shofar when God came down to the Mount of uh, Mount Sinai. And they heard the shofar. It was so loud, it terrified them. And so it's a memorial of that, probably pointing back to Exodus 19, and the blowing of the trumpet when God came down to Sinai. Because God was about to come down, uh, it got louder and louder, and the shofar was, it will be that way again when, when God comes again in, in Jesus Christ, who is also God, remember. The shofar was also blown to announce that the enemy is coming. The watchman, Ezekiel 33, talks about that. He had to blow the shofar, the ram's horn, or some other horn, a curved horn, that's a wake-up call. Wake up, everybody. Get ready. The enemy's coming. Now, Joel 2, verses 1 and 2, the first part of 2. Blow, Joel 2, blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm. You see, trumpet, alarm. In my holy mountain, let the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of Jehovah is coming. For it is at hand, the day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. You may not be able to clearly see the crescent moon. So you may not know exactly which day it should be. Therefore, God is able to say through Christ, you won't know the day nor the hour. That and other reasons I'll talk about. Many, many speakers and many churches are saying they're sure that we're in the very last days and months or year before Christ returns. And they claim his coming is likely. And it may well be uh, sooner than we might think. I hope it is. I don't think it's in the next few days or, or weeks. No, I don't believe that. This is 2024 when I'm talking about it. But I do believe the end of 2024, starting with these fall holy days, are going to be very significant. And it will get worse and worse and worse until he finally does come. Many are hoping that they'll at least have the rapture happen. Uh, we do not teach with Light on the Rock a pre-tribulation rapture. I do teach at the end of the tribulation we will be gathered up to Christ and from there we will go to heaven while the seven last plagues, which will take several months at least, are being poured out in God's wrath on the earth. We will be gone. We'll be up in heaven with God the Father. God will take care of our children and our other loved ones who weren't ready yet to be changed to spirit and go up to heaven with us. Now, we're not going to stay in heaven. If I need you to listen to my sermons on Pentecost 2024 and on the two resurrections. Uh, I mean, sorry, the two sermons on the first resurrection. I need you to hear those so I don't have to repeat them all here. But please listen to it. Whatever you do, do not put your faith in man or woman. There's a big USA election. Our faith is in God. It's not in Trump, guys. It's not in Kamala. Okay? Our faith is not in the Elephant Party, the Republicans. It is not in the Donkey Party, the Democrats. Yes, everybody around the world, their symbol is a donkey. Would you believe it? And we are of the party of the Lamb of God. That's it. I'm not saying you can't vote. But it's going to be the lesser of two evils if you do but one will definitely be lesser than the other, in my opinion. But neither Trump nor Kamala can save America spiritually. You and I do that by praying for our country as well, like Daniel did in Daniel 9. It's okay to ask God to be merciful to the country. 
It's okay to ask God to lead the country to a revival, to repentance. And I hope, I hope you do, and I hope they do. So my advice is to be carefully watching, praying, studying God's Word, getting as close to Him as possible, finding the areas on your life that you haven't surrendered fully to God yet, overcome those, and get back in your relationship to God. And remember that Jesus said that he will come at a time you do not think, you do not expect, a time you think not. Matthew 24, verses 42 to 44, Watch therefore, be alert, stay awake. It has the meaning of staying awake. You don't know what hour your Lord is coming. If you'd known, you would have prevented the thief from coming, because even Jesus said he comes as a thief in the night unexpectedly. Therefore, also be ready. You can't wait till the last minute like the five foolish virgins who had run out of oil or were running out of oil and they were not ready. Be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour, at a time, a day you do not expect. Some translations say the day there instead of hour. In the meantime, let's talk about the Pope, Pope Francis, 2024. Pope Francis, who says he's a vicar of Christ, a representative of Christ on earth, his human government, his human representation on earth, is definitely laying the groundwork for all religions to come together. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. One world government, one world religion. He's saying that all religions have some divine inspiration. All religions. He said this recently in Singapore. And in Indonesia, when he was in those parts, talking to large crowds of, of representatives from six religions were there. One imam even came and bowed and knelt down before him. But in September 23, I think it was, 2024, he spoke to representatives of those six uh, large groups of world religions, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, Hare Krishnas, even the, uh, the, the natural creation type people as being God. And they all agreed with him. They were all applauding what he was doing and, 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 and consenting to it. He placed Christianity and all religions on the same par, and the same line together. He made it clear that Jesus is not the only way to salvation. He made that clear. Because every religion is a way to arrive at God. Sort of a comparison, an example would be they're sort of like different languages in order to arrive at God. And if God is God for all, then we're all sons and daughters of God. There's only one God, and each of us is a language, so to speak, in order to uh, arrive at God. Sheikh, Muslim, Hindu, Christian, there, there are different paths. Understood? <laughs> but Jesus himself said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am it. Peter said there's no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. Acts 4.12. So events are coming together. Pope Francis in December 2023 also announced that the priest should start being able to bless members of same-sex marriages. He did, I don't believe he said to bless the marriage, but I think he said you can bless the participants in same-sex marriage, to be fair but not the union. Uh, they've committed no crime, he says. We have to love everybody. Nothing wrong with them, so accept them. And remember, the Pope sees himself as the spiritual descendant of Simon Peter, whom he, calls, whom he says is the first Pope. Simon Peter the Apostle. We do not believe he was the first Pope. Not at all. There is a statue of Peter. Remember, Pope Francis uh, is from Buenos Aires, Argentina. And there in Argentina is a statue of St. Peter. And on the statue, there was a halo around him, which symbolized holiness. And in his right hand were keys. Matthew 16, verses 17 to 19, when Yeshua, Jesus said, um, I, uh, you know, I'm going to give you these keys for what you establish on earth will be established in heaven. And uh, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and unbind here, will be unbound in heaven. And so authority, authority to 
discuss the Word of God. So the Pope was all set to announce on his birthday, the day after his birthday, December 17, 2023, all set to announce what I just said, that we can bless the participants of same-sex marriage, which even the Catholic Church has always said, no, you can't. The Pope is now saying, yes, you can. On the Pope's birthday, December 17, 2023, we'll try to put up something lightning. Well, insurance companies call it an act of God. Lightning struck the statue of St. Peter in Buenos Aires. When it struck the statue, it blew off the hand of the statue, which was holding the keys, the authority to bind and unbind. God, I think, was clearly saying, Pope, you have no authority from me to do this. I am not blessing your actions. And the halo is gone. The holiness is gone. This is all in spite of the fact there's a, there are two lightning rods 30, 40 feet away. It didn't stop it. So the lightning strike blew off the right hand of the statue of Peter, which held the keys of authority. Isn't that amazing? I'll put in the notes the link you can click on and see for yourself the pictures of what I'm talking about. God in heaven is making it clear. I am not supporting what Pope Francis is doing. I am not. I'm blown off the, the, the keys of authority. He did not have authority to unbind that marriage between a man and a woman. But he certainly, Pope Francis certainly is setting the stage for Revelation 13 to happen when there will be one religion, one government worldwide. I don't know if he'll be the Antichrist, the false prophet. I don't know. The Antichrist can refer to the false prophet, can also refer to the beast power. That they, They're like one. There are two of them working together, just like there will be two witnesses working as one in Jerusalem. But the stage is certainly being set for one world religion. There are two beasts mentioned in Revelation 13. The first beast is seen as coming out of the sea. Very blasphemous power. Other scriptures actually say this beast, get this, and I don't know how to explain it. This first beast comes out of the bottomless pit, out of the abyss, whatever that could mean. Revelation, read it yourself. Revelation 11.7, pause this, go and read it. Revelation 11.7, Revelation 17.8. The bottomless pit, the abyss, is where the worst of the demons are that you find about and you read about in Revelation 9. Remember when Jesus cast out the legions of angels, fallen angels of demons that were in this guy named Legion. The demons begged him, please don't send us to the bottomless pit, to the abyss. We Please don't. Can we go into those pigs over there instead? Which they did. We don't eat pork. Very unclean animal. And that's, that's what happened. They, I mean, even those demons didn't want to go there. It's a terrible place, they said. Don't send us there. But this beast power, we're told in Revelation eleven seven, 7, comes out of the bottomless pit. Now, whatever that can mean, the first beast is the military, economic, political leader that will be over the whole world. This first beast is given power and given his power, throne and his great authority by Satan, the dragon, the devil himself. It says that in Revelation 13, 2. Now, Revelation 13, verse 5, verse 5 to 8. And he was given a mouth, speaking great things. This is the first piece, the, the political military leaders and blasphemies. He was given authority to continue for three and a half years, 42 months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. This has to happen. This will happen before Christ returns. During the same time, the two witnesses are preaching in Jerusalem for 1260 days, which is also 42 months, which is also three and a half years. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme God's name. His tabernacle and those who dwell in heaven it was granted to him to make war with the saints. That's us, folks. Any of us left here? and to overcome them. Did you hear that? He's given authority to make war. Don't let that terrify you. If you're beaten, if you're jailed, if you're killed, if loved ones are beaten, jailed, or killed, 
expect it. The early church, the early prophets, Isaiah was sawn in two. Expect it. We'll have to give testimony of our faith in God no matter what. So verse 7, it was granted to him to make war with the saints and overcome them. Authority was given him over every tribe, every tongue and nation. So get this, this will be one world order. All who dwell on the earth, all, except hopefully the saints, will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And then if you read the rest of Revelation 13, you'll see there's a second beast. This one comes out of the earth. This is the false prophet. Revelation 13, verse 12. He causes everyone who dwells on the earth to worship that first beast. Verse 13. He performs great signs, even calling down fire from heaven, which deceives everyone. Wow, this is like Elijah. This must be a true prophet. Verse 15 of Revelation 13. He causes great image of the first beast that they build and make to come alive, to speak, to move, to speak at least. And any who would not worship this image of the beast would be killed. You and I will have the opportunity to duplicate Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We will not bow down to that beast image. If we don't, we will be killed. We will not be delivered like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It says we will be killed. That's what it says. He causes everyone, verses 16 to 18, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, and you won't be able to transact business. You won't be able to pay your mortgage or, or your rent or buy petrol or gasoline or food. We're going to have to have a lot of faith. And some of us may die. If they don't have the mark of the beast on their hand or forehead or take his number, 666, or whatever that number means, some are saying it means different things now, but we're getting there. So before Christ returns, for several years before Christ returns, there will be other things happening. Some horrific years are coming. Remember Revelation 6? talks about six seals and the seventh seal in Revelation 7. The first seal, the first thing Jesus said is, don't be deceived. It was the first seal is a white horse, false religion. The first, the first four seals, the four horsemen, the white horse, false teachers, the red horse who takes peace from the earth, brings a lot of war. I think we're coming into that. We might hit a time of apparent peace when people are saying, peace, peace, but there is no peace, a black horse follows. Famine worldwide, so severe you can't hardly find food anywhere. Followed then by the pale horse or green horse. The Greek word there for pale or green is chloros. So some people feel like chlorophyll, that it's a greenish colored pale horse. Death and destruction that will affect the fourth of the world. If it means a fourth of the population, that's two billion people. It might just mean a fourth of the territorial part of the world. And so now uh, we're in the fifth seal of Revelation 6, and that's the great tribulation, Satan's wrath against God's children. It lasts for three and a half years. There's a three and a half years of peace before that and a false covenant, maybe a new temple built and all of that. And then this peace power goes into the temple in Jerusalem and declares that he is now God. That's in 2 Thessalonians 2, if you want to read that. And then the sixth seal, okay, fifth seal was Satan's wrath. The sixth seal of horrible signs in the skies, near misses by asteroids, meteorite showers, even supernovas, stars exploding. They're talking about that now, already. So I think we might be very close to these times. And then the seventh seal of Revelation 7, 144,000 Israelites are sealed. 
a great number you can't count of non-Israelites are identified as having repented. I don't know if they're alive still at this point, but they came out of the great tribulation. Thank God for them too. So it won't, so it won't be just us. There'll be others repenting and being sealed after the great tribulation, the 144,000 that come out and then those that come out of the Great Tribulation, you can read that again. There are 144,000 mentioned in Revelation 14. If, whether that's the same as the one in Revelation 7, all I know is the ones in Revelation 7 refers to those from Israel, the 12 tribes. I am already sealed. You should already be sealed with the Holy Spirit. You don't need to be sealed, protected, or whatever some more. You're already sealed. So we'll talk about the 144,000 again some other time. But then after the seventh seal, you have seven last, you have seven trumpet plagues of God's wrath. Read them for yourself. I don't have time here. In Revelation 8 and 9, all of this happens before Jesus returns. The seventh trumpet will be the first resurrection when the kingdoms of this world Revelation 11.15, I think it's the passage, have become the kingdoms of our God and of his anointed one, of his Christ. That's what Christ, that's what Messiah mean, anointed one. That's when he comes back to collect the saints. His angels collect them. Matthew 24, verse 29 to 31 or so, it says that. They come and collect the elect from around the world. Meet Christ in the air and so we shall ever be with the Lord. And what's he doing? He says, I go prepare a place for you. My father wants to, you to see what we prepared for you. So that we're then going to go back to heaven, as I explained in the first resurrection sermons and the, and the Pentecost 2024 sermon. You've got to hear those if you haven't already. Why do we go to heaven? Why must we go to heaven? Because there are still seven last plagues, terrible plagues pain and suffering and boils and heat and all kind and earthquakes and all kinds of things hailstones and war so that's god's wrath and we will not be participating in the wrath to come we're verses that say that so anyway so we go to heaven why to meet god the father our father to see the mansions that have been built by Jesus for you. You guys from Africa are just going to be blown away. All of us are going to be blown away. But especially those of you who have barely, barely live in a mud hut with a thatch roof, one little room in it, and no running water. You're going to be blown away at what God has prepared for you. Don't give in to the false prophets and the beasts. So we go there to meet God, the Father. We go there to see our mansions. We go there to get final training, to learn how to work together, who's doing what. So when we do come back down to earth and land on it and rule with Christ, we all know exactly what we're supposed to each do. Exactly. No confusion. So we'll be being trained up there. Who our team is, who we're working with. We'll get a chance to meet all the prophets and prophetesses and all the wives and, and all the men of God, women of God. And you'll be a man and woman of God. And then we also have to get married to the Son of God. The marriage supper. What a great time that will be. And then at the end of all that, we mount on angelic steeds, horses. And with millions of angels... We all come back together with his angels and his saints. With Jesus Christ leading the charge, leading the way. You want to miss that? I sure don't. If you don't want to miss it, wake up. Get zealous again. Fight sin. Satan's going around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Don't let it happen. Now, I do want to mention briefly what time is it already? Wow. Uh, I'm only halfway through. We don't believe as Judaism teaches. We're not Judaism's first people, guys. We at Light on the Rock, 
do not follow the traditions, customs of Orthodox Judaism. Those of you who study it are going to get confused because they believe we're still in the Old Covenant. At best, they, they believe we're, the Messianics and the Hebrew Roots people believe we're in a uh, uh, revised, reformed, renewed, that's what I'm looking for, a renewed covenant of the Old Covenant. So they get it all mixed up. Judaism teaches that on the Feast of Trumpets, the shofar is blown 100 times. Nothing in Scripture says that. I do hope that your congregation blows the shofar on this day. Jews feel there are at least four different types. Low and then long and then ta 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 I blew some of those just so you have some idea. The tekiya, short blast, the shevarim, three blasts starting low, ending high. The terua, nine short takato blast, followed by the tekiya gadola. One very, very, very long, loud blast at the probably the 100th blast. So they call that 100th blast the last trumpet. Again, the Bible doesn't say. The Bible does say there are seven trumpets. And the seventh trumpet is when the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. And so uh, the day of Teruah uh, is the first of the seven months. Uh, they have all the holy days except atonement as two days. The Bible does not teach that. The Bible gives a specific date, the first day of the seventh month. It doesn't say the first and second. Okay, Passover is the 14th day, not the 14th, 15th. And so uh, don't follow Judaism. And the Bible does not say anything about the 10 days of awe because that's based on their belief that on a day of atonement, on Yom Kippur, your name is either in the book of life or it's not. If it's in the book of life, their teaching is it's only good for a year. And that's why you have to have all these sacrifices. And so, because that's supposed to restore you with God again. So, from trumpets to atonement, they're telling everybody, hey, repent now, avoid the Yom Kippur rush. You know, do it now. Make sure your name's, my name's in the book of life. Your name's in the book of life. God is not pulling names in and out, putting them in, taking them out. He can, and he does for a few. But the concept of having to restore your salvation with God every time is not biblical. I believe and teach that when we repent of our sins, all of our sins are forgiven and gone. And they're all put onto the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who takes all of our sins. God cleanses us of all of our sins. He writes our name in the book of life. Paul talked about different ones whose names are in the book of life. I think that's in Philippians and other, other epistles. We're redeemed and our lives are saved by Jesus Christ. And we're told that he's going to finish what he started in us. Philippians 1.6 says that. 2 Corinthians 1.22 says that. God gives us a guarantee that he will save us when he gives us the Holy Spirit. This was pictured by Pentecost. So our names don't hop in and out. And so remember, we're rewarded by our works, but reward has nothing to do with eternal life. Reward is what we'll be doing during eternal life, if anything. If our works are shallow and bare bones, there won't be much to give you as a reward. You can read that in 1 Corinthians 3, the last half of it. That those who build with haste, wood, and stubble, in the day of the Lord their works will be tested. And if it burns up in the fire, in the test, then it does. But the persons themselves, it says in 1 Corinthians 3, at the end of it, will still be saved, but as through fire, like they've just been through a fire. Not much reward. Salvation is a gift. You have been saved. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Okay, you know those verses. I hope you do. So that's our belief that we don't have to worry every year if we're going to make it or not.
Just stay close to God and you'll be fine. Remember, Jesus is called the author and finisher of our faith in Hebrews. Isn't that chapter 12 or 13? I think it's one of those. And 2 Peter 1, verses 10 to 11. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you'll never stumble. 2 Peter 1, I'm in verse 11 now. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, it's the kingdom of God, God the Father. But he's also bequeathed that now to his Son. So it's also the kingdom, as we read here, of Jesus Christ. He also shares it with us, he told the twelve apostles. I shall give you a kingdom, and each of you shall reign over one of the tribes. So it's our kingdom too. It's God's kingdom, Christ's kingdom, and my kingdom and yours. So God called you. He gave you to Jesus, Yeshua, to work with you. None can come to the Father except by me. And he won't lose anyone or anything God's given him. John 10, verses 27 to 32. All that the Father has given me, I will keep. I won't lose any of them. As his sheep, we hear his voice. We follow him. That's what it says in John 10, verses 27 to 32. Make sure you're hearing his voice. Make sure you're gathering your manna, the bread from heaven. Make sure you're doing Bible study, a lot of it. Make sure you're cutting out a lot of wasted time that a lot of us are probably spending on other things. Now in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 23 and 24, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. And may your whole spirit, i got to give a sermon on this. What, what's the difference between spirit, soul, and body? May your whole, they're not, the soul and spirit aren't the same. Soul and body aren't the same. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. I know you don't feel that, but if you really accepting the righteousness of God himself, bequeathed to us, imputed, credited to us. That's how that's possible. Be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. We're not saved by our works. We're rewarded by our works, but rewards are not salvation. Anyway, so I don't teach or believe in Judaism's concept of the ten days of all at all. It's not biblical. Don't talk about it with others. It's not biblical. Now let's go back to the return of Christ. I've already mentioned some of the ways that my teachings and beliefs from the Bible differ from many others. The old thing I was always taught growing up was Christ returns, we're resurrected, we meet him in the air, we destroy the armies that are gathered below us, and then come and land on the Mount of Olives, splits in two, and then we reign with Christ for a thousand years. All that happens in one day is what I was taught. More and more and more of us are seeing it can't be that way. First of all, there's seven last plagues to have to still go through. In Revelation 16, list them all. We're already resurrected. What do we do during those seven last plagues? That's going to take at least a few months to dry up the Euphrates and bring armies. And as I said earlier, our old teaching was, okay, we come back and then we destroy the armies that are gathered against us. No, we don't. The armies aren't even there yet. There's some armies around Jerusalem, but not the gathering of all the nations to fight Christ. That hasn't happened yet. That won't have happened yet. So the seven last plagues, the armies gathering, hasn't happened yet. But they have to happen. So that's why I teach we have to go to heaven, pictured by the two leavened loaves of Pentecost being elevated up, two of them, probably teaching the Israelites and then everybody else 
the two loaves, Israelites and Gentiles, or whatever the two loaves picture, it pictures all of God's people. They're raised up towards heaven. So we can't just go on hovering over Jerusalem in the air all that time. But we do go to heaven, meet Father, get our new names, see our new mansions, get final training. An exciting, exciting time. And we're not suffering the seven last plagues down here on earth, and neither will your children. God will take care of them. I believe the Bible shows us the Messiah will return in two passes, two phases, two stages. He comes down the first time with angels. They gather his elect from around the world who are still alive and resurrects those who died in Christ first and then gathers the elect. And then we go back to heaven, like I've just said. We're there during the months of the seven last plagues. And then we come back the second time. The first time Jesus comes on the clouds. The second time he comes on an angelic horse, white horse. And so do all the angels as well. They all come on white horses and so do you. Being led by King Jesus, the Lord of Lords. Remember the first resurrection at the seventh trump is only for spirit-filled elect. Only for the first fruits. The only ones who will be in the first resurrection are those who are first fruits who have God's Holy Spirit. Pentecost is the feast day. The only one that talks a lot about first fruits. Pentecost, two leavened loaves. I just said that one. Lifted up towards heaven. So that's another reason why I believe we do go to heaven. Matthew 22 says, the king put on a wedding for his son. That's God the Father, puts on the wedding for Christ. And Matthew 22, in the parable, he comes out and meets everybody. Where's Father? In we pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. By the way, not names. He has one name. Exodus 15, 3, Yehovah, that is my name. Psalm 83, 18, he alone has the name Yehovah. That is his name. He has other titles, wonderful counselor, prince of peace, that's Jesus' titles, son of God, you know, many, many others. So anyway, we're resurrected and the rest of the dead do not live again until the thousand years is over. Revelation 20, verses 5 and 6. Again, while we're in heaven, we meet the Father and do all those exciting things, and then we come back on our spirit white chargers. How exciting! We're not just hovering over Jerusalem. No, it's exciting. Then we come back. Remember that trumpets, by the way, are blown in all the holy days. You might have been thinking, Philip, Philip, wait a minute. There's, there's a feast of trumpets. And you're saying the resurrection is happening on Pentecost. Trumpets and blasts occurred on all the holy days. All of them. Numbers 10, verse 10. I'll read it. Numbers 10, 10. In the day of your gladness, these are joyous times to God, in your appointed feasts, and at the beginning of your months, like trumpets, like every month, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings, over your sacrifices, and so on, as a memorial for you before your God. I am Yehovah, your God. The King James seems to like to add the word solemn to feast days. It's not in the Hebrew. God's holy days are not solemn. God's holy days are days of, we just read it, gladness. Gladness. The word for feast days is simply moed. Nothing about solemnity at all. It's all gladness. Even the Day of Atonement should be a day that's not a sad day. The Jews have made this the most solemn day, the most serious day. It's a day of gladness. All the sins are being put on the Azazel goat, which is not Satan, as you'll hear my sermon on atonement, can't be Satan. Not a single verse in the whole Bible 
says a single one of anyone's sins are ever put on Satan. He can't take them. He has his, enough sins of his old, own. The only one who could take someone else's sin is someone who is sinless. That's not Satan. And there's no verse that says Satan takes our sins upon himself or that God puts our sins upon Satan. Not one verse. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So these are days of gladness. And though the last trump of the seven trumpets will have been blown, that doesn't mean that there will never ever be another shofar blown, another trumpet blown. And remember the day of Yom Teruah trumpets, that what, we, what we call day of trumpets, really means blasts. This holy day is a day of teruah, not just trumpets, but blasts and shouts, noise, screams if you're on the wrong side, shouts of joy and jubilation if you're on the right side. It will definitely be a loud day. And I want to be there. 2 Corinthians 4, you just read this yourself, but 2 Corinthians 2, verses 14 to 17, make a note to look it up. We're being led in triumph by Jesus Christ, and those who are his people have the aroma of life, and those who are not his people are who are perishing the aroma of death. They'll be the ones screaming. Now, I do believe this happens on the day of trumpets. Some of you are already ahead of me and thinking, well, how can you do that? Because now you're claiming to know the day and the hour. And we're not supposed to know the day and the hour. Keep in mind that the day of trumpets and the, the first day of any new month, you had to see a sliver of light of the moon in the sky. We're going to have so much ash in the sky from volcanic eruptions, from atomic war, from meteorite land meteors crashing into the earth near misses by asteroids and war we'll be fortunate to be able to see anything nuclear darkness and all that could be happening it'll be very hard to even tell time your smartwatch your smartphone your computers your garage doors your cars, military equipment, airplanes, will they even be able to function if in these wars China and Russia and ourselves destroyed the satellites that are up in the sky? That control all of that. We may not be able to get food or water. And we may not be able to know what time it is or what day it even is. Just watch and be ready. Be ready. The entire power grid as we know it could be knocked out. That can happen now. Trumpets sounding the blast. That was a signal. That was an alarm. A warning. Wake up. A call to arms. A call to go fight. Sometimes it was a call to retreat. Depending on what was being blown. The shofar blasts were signals. Like a foghorn like a railroad train, like a train on a railroad, blasting that's about to enter that intersection, like a fire truck going by. That's the point of this day. they are warnings, wake up, signals, God's sons returning to earth to rule. And it's a time of massive war. We read in Zechariah 14 before, I won't take time to read it now because of time. Do read it yourself. All the nations will be gathered against Jerusalem and against Christ. And when he comes, the Lord of hosts, that's Christ in this case, will have their tongues dissolved, their eyes dissolved, the skin dissolved, except for two people. Those two people, he's going to grab them and throw them into the lake of fire. I'll read that in a minute. So Revelation 19 Revelation 19, we have the marriage supper, then the coming back, uh, riding the horse and so forth. Revelation 19, 11, let's just read all this, verses 11 to 16. And remember, Peter and Paul and James um, and the other apostles, they never knew all this. This is revealed. The revelation, it's a day of 
revelation of Jesus Christ. It wasn't the revelation of John, the revelation of Jesus, says in Revelation 1. Now I saw heaven open, verse 11, Revelation 19, 11. I'm going to read through verse 16 and continue on from there. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. This is what Yeshua really looks like, not the namby-pamby, long-haired, sweet Jesus. This is this Jesus who's coming back is coming to rule and to fight, not just come as a sweet baby in a manger. This time it's different. In righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like flame of fire, verse 12. And on his head are many crowns, symbolizing he's king of kings. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword with which he should strike the nations. It's different coming this time. He himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. The only one higher than him is God the Father, God Most High. Now verse 17, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds, Come on to the great supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and flesh of captains and mighty men, horses and those who sit on them. And I saw the beast, verse 19, the kings of the earth and their armies. The beasts, kings of the earth and all their armies, gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. This happens after the marriage supper in heaven. We just read that in the first 12 verses or so of, or 10 verses or so of Revelation 19. Please hear my sermons on the first resurrection. There are two of them I gave in 2024 and the, and the sermon on Pentecost 2024. Please hear those. Verse 20, And then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who worked, who received the mark of the beast. Don't ever, ever do that. I don't think you can mistakenly take the mark of the beast, or that wouldn't be fair. But if you're aware that that's the mark of the beast, or the name of the beast, do not take it. Even if they torture you, don't take it. They received the mark of the beast, and those who worshipped his image, these two were cast alive into the lake of fire. Someone told me the lake of fire is never mentioned in the Bible. Well, we just read it right here. Cast alive into the lake of fire. We, we've just read it. Burning with sulfur. That's brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. You can also read in Revelation 17 and 18 how Babylon the Great will fall mightily. In one, just like ancient Babylon fell in one night. It's a great city, we're, we're told in Revelation 17, 18. Babylon, the, the great that's coming, is a great city that rules the nations, rules over the kings of the earth. I'm not going to go into exactly any more about that because I think we're all, frankly, when it comes to prophecy, including me, we're all, frankly, going to be surprised how different it all ends up working out from what we so dogmatically tried to preach. So I like to ride loose in the saddle. I don't tell people I know exactly everything that's going to happen exactly. I just don't. I think that's very un un unsafe to do. Frankly, there's so many ideas about who the beast is, who the false prophet is. Will it be the pope? Will it be Islamic uh, false Christ? Islamic uh, antichrist? Who will it be? We'll see. What will be the mark of the beast? What will be his name? Is he alive today? Is he coming out of the bottomless pit? 
Will it even will the will that first beast even be human? Otherwise, why would it say it came out of the bottomless pit? I don't know. I'm just telling you what it says. Be, be, be watching. So stay close to God. Don't lock into any prophecy. We'll all be shocked, I think, in the end. We're about to be part of the greatest invasion, most exciting time. If you ever wanted to live in Bible times, there's no greater Bible times than now. This is Bible times. There's some scary times coming if you're not real close to God. I'm trying to tell people, even when people are very sick and dying, learn to cope with it. We shall all die if Christ doesn't come back real soon. All the prophets died not having received the promises yet. Death is part of life. It's part of being human. If God decrees that someone dies, so be it. It's okay. It's God's will being done. Quit worrying so much about it. About your pain, about your amputation, about your surgery, about your coming death. Just be sure you know God and know Christ. And leave things up to God. Yeah, pray for healing. Yes, of course, expect healing. But if people aren't healed, it's not a big deal. It's not. I speak of one who's lost all my parents, all my in-laws, all my grandparents, all my uncles and aunts, many of my cousins. One was even decapitated in a motorcycle accident. I've lost a sister, about to lose a brother, and I've lost my own son. And you're hearing me say death is not a big deal. Oh, at the time, I wept profusely. But I'm trying to say it's going to be some scary times coming. Get used to it. Let's read some words from Jesus. Luke 9, 23 to 26. If anyone desires to come after me, uh, after me let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Don't be so concerned about saving your life. So many came into the church because of a booklet that said everything's going to wrap up in 1975. That's a wrong motivation. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Verse 26, whoever is ashamed of me and my words... Of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's glory and of the holy angels. John 12, 23 to 26. Jesus said, The hour has come, but the Son of Man should be glorified. Glorified? He was about to be crucified. But that's how he saw it. Yes, he was, he was troubled as well. But he knew that was the path to glory. Verse 25, he who loves his life will lose it. That's what I'm trying to say. It's no big deal to lose your life. He who hates his life. Uh, otherwise, you'll, you'll deny Christ. Otherwise, you'll say lies uh, to save your own skin when, when the tormentors, and, or if you're about to be tortured, or if your children are about to be tortured. We have to be able to go through that. He who loves life, his life, will lose it. If anyone serves me, verse 26, let him follow me, and where I am there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my Father will honor. Luke 17, 24 to 33, as lightning flashes from one part of heaven shines to the other part, and you can't miss it, so also the Son of Man will be in his days. Okay, and then, uh, then in verse 26 onwards, he talks about it's going to be just like in the days of Noah. And then suddenly, suddenly, the floods came. Verse 28, just like in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank. They, they, verse 28, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. Everything going on normally. But in one day, it all happened. Suddenly. Don't get caught off guard by the suddenly things. 
Even so will be when the day of the Son of Man is revealed. If you're on the housetop, don't go down. Don't go back down and grab a couple suitcases full of stuff. There will be a time, as it goes on to say, read it yourself on the screen. Remember Lot's wife. And again, if you seek to save your life, you'll lose it. There's coming a time we won't have time to gather everything up. You'll be lucky to gather your family together and get out, move. Maybe those who are about to kill Christians are coming to your town and you've just heard it and you don't have time to take anything except your family and leave. Be prepared to do that. Matthew 16 says the same thing all over again. If you seek to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you're willing to lose your life for my sake, Matthew 16, 25, you will find it. And 1 Thessalonians 3, 13, at the coming of Jesus Christ with all his saints. Verse Jude 14, with coming with ten thousands, tens of thousands of his saints. And then we land on the Mount of Olives, all described in Zechariah 14. And then we go to Jerusalem. Mount of Olives splits in two. With all these earthquakes, I doubt very much that any temple that's been built will remain standing because we need a new temple in the millennium. I believe that will be the fourth temple. I believe it's very likely there will be a third temple where the beast system declares he is God in there. Second Thessalonians 2. That will all be destroyed. And then we start to rule in Jerusalem. But remember, then the next thing that happens is Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3. There's nothing in these verses, though, that says a single sin is placed on Satan. It simply says a strong angel, maybe Michael, maybe someone else, will capture him and presumably all the demons, all his demons as well, although it doesn't say that. But Satan and all that he represents will be put in chains, thrown into a bottomless pit. Not a word here of a single sin being able to be taken by someone so sinful. He has no room for any more sins. He can't. There's not a scripture that says he does. John 1, 29 says, Behold the Lamb of God, Jesus, who takes away the sin of the world. Isaiah 53 Verse 6, the last part, Yehovah has laid on him the iniquity of us all, not on Satan. Isaiah 53, 11 and 12 says, The righteous servant, not Satan, shall bear their iniquities. Last part of verse 12, And he bore the sin of many. Yeah, we were all taught that all the sins are put on Satan. Show me one verse. I asked for one. It says that's what happens. All the verses, says all the sins go upon him, upon Jesus Christ, not Satan. So Satan is confined to the bottomless pit for a thousand years, presumably with his demons. The reign of Christ will begin, joined with us, reigning with him. We'll be teaching and ruling, teaching God's way. Ruling God's way as a servant. Don't seek to lord it over others, Jesus said. But when you lead, lead as a servant like I have, Jesus said. So come, Lord Jesus. Father in heaven, send him back soon. Let's pray. We'll conclude. Oh God in heaven, we come to you. And yes, Lord Jesus, we speak to you also. Thank you so much for everything you've done for us. Father, please send Jesus back soon. Please do. The world is getting worse and worse, and it's going to become indescribably worse. So we raise our hands like a child, raising up his hands to father, to his mother, whatever, wants to be lifted up. Smile upon us. Gaze with joy upon your children. Bring us together, Father, your true people. We're all so divided right now. Bring your people together, Father. 
Christ is not divided. Those who truly are your people, who have your Holy Spirit, bring us together. Protect us, please, as much as you will from all this that's happening, not because we love our life, but because you say that you could also protect us. We trust you, whether you do or not. Help us to have faith in you and never give up. Please come soon, Jesus. Father, send him soon. We look forward to the meaning of the Feast of Trumpets, the day of blasts. We thank you so much for this understanding. We thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are such a wonderful, wonderful Father. We thank you for the wonderful Savior we have. Thank you, Jesus, for everything you are. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others. <music>